In today's world, it often feels there's not enough, at least for me. You know, enough time, enough money, or really important things like snow. (laughs) But really, you know, above all, I find there's not enough kindness or love, especially towards ourselves, that I experience personally. You know, we live in a society which tends to value achievement and wealth accumulation above all else. And I think the real challenge is that most of us don't know what enough is. I know I didn't. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about right now, based on my experiences as a climber and a snowboarder. I grew up in San Diego. I played team sports. I was actually born lacking. I was born without enough, you might say. I was born without a right pectoral muscle. And I also grew up in a loving family, but there was a lot of criticism that left all of the family a little scared and on edge. And little did I know that being scared and on edge would just be the perfect way to feel for my future career in the mountains. (laughs) At 14 years of age, I got out of team sports because When it became time to shower with the team, I just couldn't handle it. People staring at my chest. I was just like, you know, hiding out, going, oh, no, don't look at me. I'd be a wallflower. But I quit team sports and I started skateboarding. You know, no showers were required for skateboarding. (laughs) And you know what? They weren't even recommended. At 14 years old, after I started skateboarding, I got a boob job. And I'm still the only man I know with one. (laughs) And then I I finished high school and wanted something more. I wanted to take a year off before going to college and I heard about Jackson Hole and I moved here. That was 26 years ago. (laughs) And I moved here to try the new sport of snowboarding. And this sport was something that really drew me, especially growing up surfing and skateboarding. But another thing, you know, I think it's something that, it was the first thing I was passionate about that I could really connect with. All these team sports and other things, I never had a true passion until I started snowboarding. The feeling and the joy I got from sliding through and in and on snow and floating in snow was unbelievable. But I always wanted more. You know, I started off on the bunny slopes and quickly worked my way to, up to the expert shoots all in my first two weeks of snowboarding. And I was here at a time when none of the Tetons had been snowboarded. I thought, man, I want to go snowboard up in the Tetons. I want to snowboard the Grand Teton, which I did in 1989 with the help of a couple of my mentors who really taught me a lot of what I needed to know in the world of mountaineering and and just being in the mountains and taking care of myself. And I also, you know, got press. I was on the cover of the news and the guide, believe it. We had two newspapers at one point. The same week, I was on the cover of both papers. That was a good week for me, you know. There were some (laughs) serious benefits to being on the cover of the papers when when you're 20 years old. But that was not enough. I wanted more. I wanted to snowboard the seven summits, the highest mountain on each continent. And I started that project in 2003 on Aconcagua and went to these other peaks. This is on Karsten's Pyramid. And I'm going to fast forward because I don't have a lot of time and I want to just get to my main point, which isn't just that snowboarding is a beautiful thing and Jackson Hole is an amazing place. It's about what's inside and that we don't always have to reach. And I went to, I was ticking off these seven summits over the years. I was climbing and snowboarding. Three of them I had to do two times. Finally, it was time for me for the last one. Six down, one to go. Mount Everest, the granddaddy of them all. And I didn't just want to snowboard Mount Everest. I wanted to snowboard it by its most beautiful line, the North Face, the direct Hornbein Kuwar on the North Face. And I wanted to snowboard it without oxygen. And I wanted to go with a small team. 
I wanted to do it in what I considered the ideal style. And I did that finally in 2003 with a small team. And on our first attempt, we were just about to get on the face and we hear a car crash sound. And it's dark, it's midnight. And we all, you know, look at each other. We're roped together on a glacier with crevasses all around us. And crevasses are holes in ice underneath the snow, so you never know where they are. Good way to keep you on edge. And the noise got louder and louder, and we had our little beams of headlights, the four of us, looking in the direction that it was getting louder. All of a sudden, we see a wall of white. The Sherpas and I turn around, jump down on our packs. Jimmy stands up, faces the thing in the Jesus Christ pose, and I think I remember him saying, take me. And I'm just like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> All of a sudden, we're hammered by this wind blast from a Serac fall. And all of a sudden, it gets quiet. We look around. We see chunks of snow and ice around us, car-sized blocks. We were spared at that moment. We quickly descended to camp to change our underwear. And uh, on our second attempt, several thousand feet up the face in deep snow, it was time to turn around. It wasn't happening. I wanted this more than anything. This was the last of the seven summits, my quest, my over 10 year dream to climb and snowboard these mountains. I put all my money, my ego into this and it was at hand, yet it wasn't happening. Conditions were not right. The avalanche danger was too high. I'd made poor decisions before here in the Tetons and suffered the consequences by being in a big avalanche and nearly dying and spending years of my life recovering. And I didn't want to do that again and I didn't want to lose my life. I was also responsible for, for other people this time as the leader of the expedition. So we turned around and I got to do one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. I snowboarded powder snow on the lower half of Mount Everest, something I'll proudly tell my children about one day. And you know, when I got home, it was interesting because for a long time I felt like a failure. I felt like I was not enough for not succeeding on this dream. And it had been a long process now to realize that my decision to turn back on Everest was actually a defining moment of success in my life. I now understand a way of being not driven by ego, not driven by ego, but by heart. And that's enough. That is enough. Thank you.